news.trust.org from Thomson Reuters, India-China commanders meet after border clash amid calls for boycott of Chinese goods. Indian and Chinese military commanders met on Monday to try to ease tensions at their disputed Himalayan border as the public mood hardened in India for a military and economic repulse following the worst clash in more than five decades. Major Indian traders called for a boycott of Chinese goods and the state of Maharashtra, home to India's financial capital of Mumbai, put three initial investment proposals from Chinese companies worth 50 million rupees on hold just days after signing the agreements. Now, I understand why they're doing this. I understand the response and to say, well, look, we can't do business with you because you're hurting us. You know, there's this conflict. We don't want to feed this conflict. But that's not really how things work. This is not the best way of going about this. We know the, the famous adage, when goods don't cross borders, troops will which is to say that countries that trade don't fight. Now, here's there's another problem in this, in, in the collectivism, in the language, in the you here, right? And now, when we saw the story last week and covered this, we didn't see that the, the death counts uh, for China, it just said 20 Indian soldiers, and they confirmed that. Um, and now China hasn't said yet, as far as I know, but it's in this article, China has not disclosed how many casualties it suffered, though an Indian minister has said around 40 Chinese soldiers may have been killed. So this is, this is, you know, still a relatively big deal in international affairs where 60 people die in a single incident. And this was, this is the the stone age fight that we saw on the border where they were fighting at night on a ledge with sticks and rebar and rocks. And you're, and you're like, how dumb do, do you have to be? How gullible? And I keep, anytime I, I, I hear something like this, just, man, that Voltaire quote keeps popping up in my head. Those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocity. Well, what's the absurdity here? What's the big absurdity? The big absurdity is the collective identity of Indians and Chinese people. Well, again, you know, I understand more so than the United States. These are people united by cultural heritage and and ethnic relationships and and deep history and things like that and you go okay but what unites them as countries because china you have you know the the uyghurs in the north in india you you have the caste system you, you have dispute borders with pakistan uh, border disputes with pakistan you have, you have all sorts of different other ethnic minority groups who are being forced into this collective identity as indians or chinese and why, as an Indian, would you want to say, well, I'm going to stop doing business with people in China because the government of China is doing this bad thing to this government of India? Your oppressors are fighting with my oppressors. So uh, I'm going to fight with you, too. You're like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Now, okay, they're not fighting. But withdrawing economic support, disassociating, makes it worse because now less, board, less goods are crossing the borders there's a good chance that more troops will as a result. Now, I don't think that's actually going to happen here. I'm, I'm pretty confident and I'm hopeful that this is going to de-escalate, that this is not going to turn into a Chinese-Indian war. No, but that the uh, economic repercussions being carried out by individuals, now, it's it's a little more complicated than than I've made it out so far, right? Because what if this company... In India, this is not doing business with China. Maybe they're a major corporation that benefits from the Indian government's protectionism. They don't. They want to defend their racket, and that's part of the challenge here. Is that when we see this, to not uh, be able to separate motivations and assume, like even me, even me, when I read this, I was like, "Oh well, major Indian traders. Well, major Indian traders. Those those, those are private individuals. Those aren't those aren't government officials." And you go. Damn it, Adam! Really, did you did you not realize your own point here? That that you know, uh, India is, is you know just as corporatist as, as I don't want to say any other country. I'm sure in this regard, America is number one. 
Um, but this is a, a major limitation of economic activity. $658 million. Now, even though this is money shuffling through banks and corporate bank accounts, if it gets spent on development, if it gets spent on, on business, like eventually that turns into quality of life for real people. So in order to maintain this racket of national identity over individual identity or, or community identity or, or even ethnic, like, you know, there's nothing wrong with ethnic identity. You know, I'm, I'm half German, half Jewish, uh, constantly at war with myself. And, and so, you know, I can identify and, and, and celebrate those things as heritage, as a fact of life and say, yeah, that's part of how we got there. Nationalism, do I, do I, I, I certainly identify as American. And I think more than most Americans, I'm conscientious and very proud of the heritage that that represents. But I'm at the same time then attuned to those deeper principles that were represented by the American Revolution of not being a servant to a distant authority. And, and by that measure, uh, most of America has become very un-American. So that national identity in a way that gets you to give up your individual identity is very dangerous. And an Indian government source said commanders met in Moldo on the Chinese side of the line of actual control, the de facto, de facto border, dividing India's Ladakh region from the Chinese-held Aksai Chin. Now, how did I mention the Uyghurs and all the, and not say anything about Tibet? China is, is essentially an empire. I mean, every government in the world today, uh, every, every big one, I don't know how big, but you look at all the big governments in the world today, they're empires. They're not voluntary community. I mean, well, well, that's the difference, right? Essentially, either, either an empire or a central government <clears throat> extending its control over territories, regions, and people that that you don't have a legitimate claim to, <clears throat> and not that there is such a thing as a legitimate claim of government, but that is a community government, perhaps, or a voluntary government. You know, you're, you're not voluntary in, voluntarily inviting people to join your territory. You're forcing them into it. Well, that's a great example of this. China, in a previous rounds, uh, round of talks, had asked India to stop all construction work in what it says is Chinese territory. China's, anyway... Um, Many in India have called for Prime Minister Narendra Modi's nationalist government, again, with the nationalism, uh, to show it will not be bullied, remembering their country's humiliation in a brief border war, war against China in 1962. Now, again, humiliate. Why? Why would you be humiliated as a country, as a people, because your attackers, your victimizers, your, your captors in government did something embarrassing. No, this is obviously a very nationalist narrative. I don't think Reuters even recognizes in its presumption here. And this is by Sanjeev Miglani and uh, Dev Jyot Goshal. Definitely mispronouncing those names. These are writers with Reuters in New Delhi. And they point out it's a nationalist government maybe they're realizing, I hope, that there's a, an, an assumption of nationalism in the very language that they use. So how does this go into the scale of international <clears throat> relations? China is India's second biggest trading partner with bilateral trade worth $87 in the 29th fiscal year of March 9, uh, of 2019. Trade deficit of $53.57 in China's favor the widest India has with any country. Trade deficit, that's that's kind of like China propping up the Indian economy, or I should say part of the status Indian economy in a very significant way. So what happens when a, a relationship like that falters? Individuals suffer. The, the people, the victims of this, uh, you know, are uh, not the governments of India and China. And in and, and, and some way, not just the, the soldiers who died or participated in that conflict. And it's like, if you died as, as a Chinese or Indian soldier fighting for your government's territory on a disputed border and you knowingly, willingly went into a fight to kill, to hurt other people with stones and sticks, like, I'm, I'm not going to have a lot of sympathy for you. But I do have a lot of sympathy for the real victims here, the people of India and China, 
who will suffer economically unnecessarily so that their governments can keep playing this silly game of nationalism. Thank <laughs> you.